and um, mark. I mean, we, we can judge out of our own um, our own markets and own uh, participants. They really change their needs as they go. They come with a certain certain things they want to 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 hear from us, to want to get from us in the very beginning, let's say in 2020. And now in 2021, they say, oh, we really changed, the market really changed and we want something else. So I think this uh, adjustments and adoption to the uh, current world are happening as we go. And, and the most um, important thing- Mark, I mean- we, um, Sorry. And the most, uh, one of the most important things that we have to do as business schools is to be ready to change every time. And you know, not all of us, not the professors and not all the institutions are ready to change. And they, um, one of the strategies they, that, they, that, they, that they choose and they follow is to wait because they think that things will come back to the previous state. So they're waiting for the past. And it's not true. We'll never, we'll never find ourselves in the past. Uh, 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 recently, I was talking to my friend who is in the uh, hotel industry and ask him, what are your expectations for the COVID and for this you know, pandemic situation? And he said, well, the most optimistic um, uh, forecast is 2025 when it's oh going to be God. over. Oh yeah, it's most optimistic uh, time. And 2025 is enough to set any standards, any new traditions in business education. So we have to change, we have to uh, experiment. And doing classes just in Zoom or doing programs, MBA programs just in Zoom, it's not a change. We have to rethink what we teach, how we teach, and what our clients do. <laughs> and this music was the end of my speech. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Constantin. Thank you so much. So, uh, dear, dear colleagues, I would like you to continue what the first speaker said and to say that's why, and, and only in this uh, uh, way we will uh, have the good discussion so Constantin, thank you so much and but thank you so much for the 2025 it's also <laughs> one of the challenges which we are facing <laughs> okay and joshua park dean of Solbridge international school of business south korea please joshua <clears throat> uh thank you for the uh, invitation and chance to speak in front of nice nice this, seeing uh, you yeah distinguished group and um i echo uh, Constantine and congratulating our university for the, the landmark uh, of reaching 25 years. Um, uh, it's, it's an excellent achievement. And uh, hopefully, uh, as a young school, we'll be able to celebrate our 25th year with as much aplomb as, uh, as you've been able to. Um, so continuing on with, I think, the theme that uh, Constantine mentioned, um, and I think this is, uh, this is maybe putting together both kind of the risky aspect of uh, the, the uh, COVID era that we're facing, as well as kind of uh, pre-COVID changes that the world has been saying. And, you know, I do see the Executive Vice President of AACSB, Tim uh, Mescon, here in the audience. Um, I think one of the things that we recognize is uh, we do need to be nimble and be ready to change. But at the same time, we also have to be centered with regards to what our values are. Uh, as a business institution. And this also works for the MBA program as well. And, you know, we've just handed in our kind of our midterm review for the next cycle of accreditation. And we've had a lot of chance, uh, chances to kind of examine what our core values are while we are being nimble to the changes that, uh, you know, the, the changing world has, has brought. So I guess I can maybe speak about three themes um, in terms of both kind of uh, how we can meet the challenges of uh, today's world in addition to maybe setting the trend in MBA education. And I guess my three themes would be uh, being nimble, which I have already mentioned. Um, second seems to be along those lines that uh, the education that we do provide does need to be very much business practice oriented as opposed to being extremely academic. And then thirdly, uh, and very fitting for this scene, it does need to be uh, pretty international. So along these lines, when I uh, say nimble, um, uh, one, it does, I, I do feel that, um, especially for a, an MBA education, in terms of the curriculum, um, I would say uh, there's no one correct answer, but uh, it seems as though the direction that we've decided to go in and uh, seeming to fit the needs of the industry is to maybe make the, um, the offerings and the curriculum uh, both flexible and a little bit more slim. 
So what I mean by this is, as opposed to having too many uh, traditional core courses that all students must have, uh, A, we've uh, shrunk down the, the core courses uh, that needs to be taken by all individuals who are entering uh, our MBA program. Uh, but in addition to that, we've also shrunk the number of credits that are necessary to graduate, instead adding more to our non-curricular aspects. So mm -hmm. instead of a, a more comprehensive, longer two-year MBA program, we have followed the trend of many other universities uh, in offering a one-year um, very, very concentrated MBA program with half of it uh, being very much electives and specializations and uh, a lot of non-curricular uh, uh, practice-based um, education uh, that we have. Um, in addition to that, I do feel that uh, you know, technological agility or uh, digital literacy is another keyword that's come out. And you know, especially with uh, the COVID era and you know, everyone suddenly becoming uh, experts at Zoom meetings, um, I think you know, uh, technological agility is more than uh, just about uh, being adept on Zoom. Uh, so I think definitely as a par part of our MBA program, we do need to have uh, as part of our, our core offerings, something to make our you know, executives or individuals who have some experience in the workplace uh, added to their profile or added to their skill set, uh, technological abilities. Um, you know, being able to deal with you know big data, being able to use some of the latest apps, uh, and uh, using that as part of their business practices. And then finally, in terms of delivery, one of the things that we have added and uh, we've uh, put into our accreditation um, application is uh, a new online offering. So I think. Traditionally, we've been uh, going with fully offline offerings, and you know one of the the values that we've had is you know experience Korea, come here. Uh, you know we pride ourselves in having um, students. Um, uh, yeah, very ominous. Um, uh, so we, uh, we do. <laughs> I think it's a mark for everybody to stop. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, I, I will. I will. Uh, yeah, I, I will cut myself a little bit shorter before Armageddon uh, hits us uh, in the form of uh, that music. But uh, pretty much along the lines of, um, you know, we do pride ourselves and value uh, providing a Korean context by bringing students to Korea. But at the same time, um, you know, we do need to be ready to provide hybrid education or students who can only be in Korea for, let's say, a month or a semester or two months or maybe even a few weeks and be able to offer the same quality of education, whether it's online or hybrid or offline. So that's the, the flexibility that we've needed to offer. Otherwise, um, I don't think an MBA program uh, can, can be viable, especially with the challenges that we're facing. Mm -hmm. um, the second theme I talked about is business practice oriented education. Uh, definitely, I do feel that capstone and those kinds of uh, courses are necessary. But even for the core traditional courses, we do need to add in a lot of uh, practice oriented case uh, cases or exercises, role plays to make sure that it fits in with uh, the work that they're doing when they go back into the, the workplace. And then finally, making sure that we have this kind of an international network, because a lot of these new developments, it's very tough for one institution to develop just on their own. But if we're able to share resources with each other, then this, uh, especially between AACSB accredited or um, uh, institutions that are seeking AACSB accreditation, uh, we can share the resources and you know, uh, have a critical mass of uh, students as well as resources to be able to offer the best services and skill sets to our customers, uh, our students. So uh, those are the three things that I would add to this discussion. And uh, I'll, I guess I'll stop here before the, the ominous okay. music cuts me off again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear Joshua. Uh, Dick Alex, maybe you have some questions to the speakers. Uh, uh, maybe some questions to Joshua. Or we will do it at the end of our discussion, of our panel. Okay, at the end. So, <clears throat> uh, the Alma U uh, staff asked me to, to give a floor to Danitsa Purk. She now sent, she sent the, uh, the greetings uh, to Alma U and uh, let us listen and please put the video. No, no, no voice, sorry. We can't hear. Sorry, we can't hear.
share it with the voice. We can't hear the voice. No. Maybe we will continue. Okay, we will continue. The that, yeah, and you you will check uh, with this voice because we we can see this fantastic lady, but we we can't hear her. Please <laughs> do it. Okay, and uh, I would like to give a floor to Kenji Yoko Yokoyama, senior associate <clears throat> dean of NUCB Business School from Japan. Please, Kenyon, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you for your kind introduction. Also, I'd like you to accept my hearty congratulation on the 25th anniversary of your business and management, especially MBA programs and the congratulations. And I want to talk about from the viewpoint of, uh, uh, you know, uh, how MBA education should develop from now in relation to, uh, you know, post corona context, I think. Let me say something. And I show you what three points. Portfolio, especially program portfolio. And the second one, the virtual learning. And the final one is that more like uh, instructor viewpoints. View First of all, at least, in, you know, what we have to reorient in our portfolio program because people need to be uh, able to confront relevant programs. They are wicked and complex. And however, okay. our present offers are mostly uh, and the spinary, which are poorly prepared to solve and solve real problems, and we need to rebalance this mix. This new offers should be a mission oriented and a new approach to innovation policy, or focus on focus in solving relevant problems, not in the development of disciplinary profiles. And this could be some example of the kind of missions and problems we should pay the most attention to. Uh, their sustainability, climate change, demography, and uh, human flourishing, managing AI for human goods, and public health, and so forth. But to generate new programs, we don't need to build them from the scratch. With a modu modular and uh, stackable approach, we can reuse large parts of our present learning resources with a kind of acupuncture <laughs> design. Next one is a virtual learning. Yes, virtual learning won't take over in-person classes in most cases, that's right. But going forward, business schools have no choice but to embrace remote learning and offer more of it. And these adaptation will need to be made while and uh, predicting tuition revenues, which are also more challenging. Unfortunately, this means that schools that are already struggling financially to survive might not make it. If I have to say more about the digital education, remote te teaching, especially the emergency response and online education are not the real digital education, or at least they don't develop the complete potential for the digital. Mostly, they translate directly to physical paradigm centered in large courses, programs, and uh, synchronous sessions. However, we need modularity, focus on skills and flexibility in the user experiences. And the digital education uses the power of digital resources, tools, and platforms, and communities for e effective learning. Digital is the tool to make, make possible an education characterized by extreme flexibility and the personalization that provides an active learning experience. If these things have realized, we'll be able to show how capable business schools and their education are. Let me move on to the instructors and uh, faculty members perspective. In organization based in, based in knowledge and able to create and innovate an evolution of our value proposition, culture, and organization will be favorable without transformation of our human talent. Our actual you know, professors should assume 
and develop new emerging roles. And this diversification possibly will implicate specializations as curators, designers, inspirational speakers for master classes, coaches, etc. Instructors will have to continue to learn how to maximize the potential of new technology, balancing remote instructors with an in-person experiences. Successful faculty will develop engaging virtual classes with synchronous activities that activate students' critical thinking and analytical skills. And meanwhile, we'll need to find new ways to help students reap the benefits of a traditional in-person business education, building a network, finding a job, connecting with a mentor, <laughs> and gaining funding for startup. Accessing these elements of a business school education flexibly, either in person or virtually, will become key. And the new technologies that are emerging will allow for more natural and stilted interactions between instructors and students and potential employers and job seekers and classmates. As business school develops students to become resilient leaders who can effectively manage change during uncertain and unprecedented times, we need to lead by example. Now, with countless uncertainties before us, the pandemic provides an opportunity to reimagine business education and make changes to ensure that we are preparing for students but to positively transform the future of business. I want to reiterate finally that we show our capability, capacity to respond in an effective way to the crisis and the, the new normal. If you can do so, if you can do that, we'll have credibility in the future. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Yokoyama. So uh, listening to you, I am not ready to agree that virtual reality is our 100% our, our future. I don't want to agree, my, me personally. Of course, I understand what you are talking about, about this new reality, about this new opportunities, of course. But from my point of view, we need to continue to um, cooperate and to contact each other, not only on this uh, in this way but of course it helps us because you are, you you see that how many people we can gather now due, during this very difficult situation and uh, we are all together we can speak we can talk of course it's a kind of but truly speaking i would be much more happy if i see you all face to face that's why i'm now here in almaty not in moscow sitting in my houses but <laughs> flying here to stay and to be without be, with my friends and that is what i am thinking about this new uh, virtual reality. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, as I understand the, uh, the, the uh, organized, the stuff, the video of uh, Daniel Sepulk is ready. Is it okay? I will show it. Hello, <laughs> my dear friends in Kazakhstan. Oh, yeah, okay. Best regards and best wishes from Slovenia, from the headquarters of Siemen and of IDC Blade School of Management. We are very proud of you. When we started with Siemen quite some time ago, Alma Yu was the uh, founding member and Azil Bekozhmetov, your president, was the one who was starting with Siemen together with a group of other people from Central and Eastern Europe and former C CIS countries. So we came very far all together, we were growing together, learning together. And today we were all also very, very proud when in Trieste a month ago. A what happened again? Something, something goes wrong. Okay. Okay. It's okay. Something happened again.
Okay, no problem. Then we will go. We will go further. So uh, I would like to give a floor to uh, my good friend Hermé Remo. <laughs> Hermé, Hermé, uh, nice to nice seeing you. Nice Hello. seeing you again. Hello. How are you? Well, yeah, thank you so much. I am great. I'm it's okay. So nice to see you. And uh, what would you say about the questions which we are now discussing? <clears throat> So Natalia, first, I had an issue with my laptop, so I have to restart my laptop. So are we still on the first question about the current trend or did you move to another one? <laughs> I'm sorry about it. Current trend, okay. material uh, skill set, development, okay. learning outcomes like that, programs and evol in, in, uh, involvement and improvement and uh, international okay. standards like that. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so, the first thing that I would like to say here is who do we want our MBA participant to be at the end of a program that we are delivering, all of us? Um, mm -hmm. What I can see at the moment is uh, I think that the many MBA programs are going towards the direction of uh, a kind of a toolkit that we deliver and maybe more solution oriented. Whereas I believe that our role, our job, at universities and business school is much more to bring those participants to a problem solving orientation kind of a perspective of the MBA. So in other words, for me, an MBA program is all about taking a step back, reflecting on what you are doing and thinking. And if we do not give the tools for those participants to think, then we do not help them to better understand how they can solve the problem that will be coming in the future, problem that we don't even know what it will be all about today. So that's the key issue in my view. So I would say that our job is to think of a curriculum that would very much force the participant to think and to reflect and to know how they would find solution later on for problems that we don't know today. So that's my first point. The second, um, I would say, is very much related to um, competition from uh, EdTech. Um, we did not discuss that much that aspect so far, um, but I do believe that in the next five to 10 years, um, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, WeChat, etc., will be providers of higher education. And I would say that ourselves uh, as institution, um, I would say traditional higher education institution, if we do not understand and we do not anticipate today the danger of that, I would say, increasing competition, we might be in trouble in 10 years time because, um, I mean, you have seen Netflix is a very good example of disruptive innovation. Um, entering the, uh, uh, the videos and uh, the, the cinema kind of a market. And I think that five years ago, nobody would have um, bet on Netflix chance of success. So my point here is um, we should also think in the future, in the near future, what is the value of a diploma that is delivered by universities and business school? If tomorrow, uh, you might have seen, by the way, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, who have renamed Facebook as with a new name, Meta, to better encapsulate all the different, um, I would say, activities that now Facebook, named Meta, it will be doing in the future and today. As part of it, you might have heard as well of the Metaverse uh, kind of a concept that Mark Zuckerberg is uh, pushing. But as part of it, if you understand virtual reality future a bit, um, clearly there is a, a, a big opportunity for a company like Meta to very much enter the higher education market with a technology that we don't have today on our side. I mean, not a single university and business school today can compete on that floor with a company like Meta. So meaning that tomorrow, if they bring, I would say, a very nice content, plus a very nice way of delivery, 
I would agree with you, Natalia, that I would prefer face-to-face -face meeting with people, <laughs> but you would have a big, large part of the population of executive who will certainly play the game with those kind of new ed tech company. So here again, if we take a step back ourselves, I think that the key point for us is how could we increase the value of a diploma that is delivered by a traditional university or a traditional business school, even if we have a greater technology used here as part of it. I think it's, um, we are somewhat in danger. I think it's almost like uh, uh, the planet is burning, but uh, we are looking uh, somewhere else. It's uh, almost the same thing on our side, including myself. I still don't know how to, uh, I mean, I have a few ideas, but uh, on your own is very complicated, of course, to, uh, um, to go towards that kind of a big challenge. So that's one aspect. And then uh, the other uh, point- Herve, if, to... Herve, if you have some ideas, could... Herve, if yes. you have some ideas, uh, could you share it with us? <laughs> I have ideas, but I mean, <laughs> I think that the first thing, I mean, um, to be transparent here, I do believe that one single institution cannot make it on its own. So having, a, a, I would say, an association or an alliance of institution not competing with Meta or not competing with LinkedIn on that specific aspect uh, would be enough, but at least we can be somewhat some kind of a first mover uh, on that specific field. And at some stage starting reinforcing the value of traditional universities can be traditional, but we can be also very modern and understand what will be the future of higher education. But uh, again, here, virtual reality will be certainly part of the game, clearly. And I'm saying game, and I suspect that the gamification of the curriculum is also a trend today. So I think that the, the, if I was, in a sense, the, uh, the president of whatever association of university or business school in Europe or whatever, maybe I would give, I mean, open the floor to have a pool of resources for five, 10, 20 uh, universities and business schools to use as a kind of a catalog uh, part of it in order to be competitive in, in our respective market. Um, maybe the last point that I wanted to make uh, is also about the, um, the VUCA world. I very much like the, uh, the speech that uh, Sergey has made uh, in the introduction of, this, of, of the day. Um, here, uh, I would say that more than managing change, I think that our job as part of MBAs is also to train our participant and our executive to generate change. So I fully agree that there is no more stability, but the point of managing change is almost always being behind change. And the idea here is how could we train executive to generate change? So therefore, they will be the one doing the change or initiating the change. So I think it's an interesting aspect that uh, I'm also trying to cover as part of the MBA, but obviously very difficult, <laughs> of course. So that's, uh, I mean, and maybe a last comment um, about the experiential part of uh, what we offer in our respective programs. I do believe that uh, the future for us to distinguish ourselves, and this is where we could compete with those ed tech companies, is to make our um, MBA curriculum more project-based oriented, more experiential. So why not having a one week session in a couple of companies um, where the CEOs of the company will come with key issues to be managed or to be solved, and then we have a group of 20, 30, 40 participants, almost like a hackathon, doing, finding, thinking, and providing solution, potential solution. So I think that this project um, and real life kind of experience is something that we can still, as a traditional university or business school, do and deliver because we have the connection with those companies, because we are locally based. So I think that one way for us to compete with this ed tech is the fact that we are all set up in cities 
in a geographical areas where we have a connection with businesses. This connection with businesses could be one of our advantage in the future, and we should not forget about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Herbert. Thank you. Uh, did, did you hear? <coughs> Did you hear what Constantine said at the beginning when, yeah, when, when he uh, was the first that the VUCA is dying and the, <laughs> some new trends that VUCA is dying? Yes, so, but I, I did not notice what is the, the, the word that you use? VUCA is dying. Yeah, yeah, but uh, what the, is the new the, concept? The new, the, concept, new the new concept is BANI, brittle, anxious, nonlinear, and incomprehensible. Inc okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, okay, that will that will be very nice to talk at the end of our discussion. What will come? What will replace uh, the VUCA if VUCA is dying? Okay. Uh, so, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, one um, one thought which I uh, mentioned. So, uh, we understand that before the era that this new era of online offline uh, education, uh, the location did matter. The location and a lot of students uh, were choosing the, their um, business schools where to where to study, also according with this um, territorial territorial basis. You know, as for Moscow, I understand. I know as for Moscow, a lot of people are um, making a choice according to the location of the business school because the Moscow is the big 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 uh, city. But um, now when uh, now, when we have a lot of programs online, so the disadvantage go away. Yes, and so the, we will struggle for the clients more and more, what you said there were, um, because we can offer the same product in the different territorial and different uh, districts. So that is the, the problem also for the quality of our programs. Thank you. Uh, Venkat Subramanian, uh, Associate Professor at Graduate School of Business of Nazarbayev University, Kazakhstan. Please, Venkat. Hello. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, uh, uh, everyone. Uh, morning. Thank you, Natalia. So, uh, I'm, I'm also Associate Dean at the Graduate School of Business. Uh, that's my other day job. Uh, so, um, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate all the colleagues and friends at Alma U on the 25 years. Uh, it's a great uh, achievement. Uh, you know, 25 years uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a measure of success, or, uh, you know, by any means. Uh, so, I just want to also respond a little bit to uh, Herb's uh, com you know, uh, comments. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, competition is there, but uh, you mentioned it can be a danger for, uh, uh, let's say, traditional players like you know, many of us. But I would say it's also an opportunity. Uh, maybe you could collaborate with them. You could work with them instead of, uh, you know, uh, working against them. Uh, so uh, there are opportunities maybe to collaborate or think about uh, ways of uh, incorporating some of the, uh, you know, uh, aspects of their business model into the traditional university business model. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and that's how, for example, many traditional airlines try to, uh, let's say compete with the low cost airlines because they basically adapted some of those uh, aspects of the business into their uh, you know uh, existing models. Uh, I just also want to talk about a little bit about uh, curriculum. Uh, the two things that we see that everybody is talking about these days, and I think many of us already do that. One is the digital transformation, digital innovation that seems to be on everybody's uh, wish list. Uh, another is sustainability. So these are two big issues that was going to run for the next five, 10 years, I guess. Um, and this, this will not going to change anytime soon. And, uh, and, and, uh, and that's been uh, particularly given the COVID, you know, digital things become even more. I mean, maybe this um, pandemic made things happen faster than otherwise it would have happened. Uh, things would have been uh, many things what we're doing today on Zoom, probably we would have done it in five years time, seven years time, but we do it now. Uh, because uh, the pandemic did it for us. Uh, so um, in that sense, uh, I think there are opportunities that we, we do uh, uh, see here. Uh, 
Uh, another thing is that um, uh, the, the speaker in uh, in the pre in the open session also mentioned this, which is that uh, more flexible ways of delivering are important now, and that's also a way to address the competition that Hel was mentioning. That uh, not um, you know be like a traditional brick, bricks and mortar model, but a bit of a bit, bit of a hybrid. So it's a combination of clicks and bricks, I would say. Uh, that 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 would work here as well in terms of delivery of those uh, courses. Uh, in terms of uh, kind of skill sets, we look at uh, again uh, partly driven by our experience in the last two years with the pandemic situation is that uh, students need to uh, need to understand a lot about managing risk. Uh, risk management, in a very broad sense, uh, is, it becomes a very key skill, uh, and managing uncertainty that means it becomes a uh, key skill. Uh, and uh, some traditional uh, skill sets that uh, you know uh, we always talk about also become important, like leadership. Uh, so how, how to make decisions in this fast environment, a VUCA world, uh, is also important. Um, uh, and uh, in in one one way, one of the things that has happened for many MBA programs um, during the pandemic is that programs have become more local uh, and, and uh, less international. Uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, we'll see uh, how this will come out. Uh, a lot of our students used to travel abroad and for exchange visits. That used to be a very important part of their experience, uh, student experience, but that's now uh, all online. So we do see uh, that's a big, uh, uh, let's say, a downside of what has happened in the last years, a couple of years. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I got to say. So thank you again. Uh, thank you very much. Спасибо большое, Венка. Oh, thank you so much. Sorry. Не, спасибо большое тоже. Thank you тоже. so much, Венка. Yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Очень приятно, да. Свечу. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. <clears throat> I would like you to talk about what what is the future of MBA programs and what will um, replace uh, uh, MBA is more than 100 years, you know, and uh, what will come after MBA if we are looking for if we are looking forward for many years. And I'd like to give a floor to my good friend Timothy Meskan, who is uh, executive vice president of and chief officer of AACSB. Tim, nice to nice seeing you. What uh, do you think about this future of MB? Well Dobro done, Natalia, so nice to see you and congratulations you, to Rector Kurin Kayeva and to Professor Osselbeck on this monumental uh, occasion. Uh, and Natalia, also, uh, Timothy, thank you so much for your greetings for the 30th anniversary of Rabe. We oh. also, yeah, we also did the, the, the put the, the greetings from uh, Karen Bagdadli and uh, right. thank for it, you also for that. It was yeah. wonderful. And I was at the greeting yesterday for the, the faculty <laughs> of banking as well. So it's uh, at Ranepa. So really, uh, it's been a busy, busy week. But I, I'd so like much. to talk about, there's, this is a fantastic panel, wonderful insights from my colleagues. And I'd like to start, Natalia, with your work with Robin, because I think it, it captures what, what many have spoken about al already, about the power of global alliances. Now, some of these are national, some of these are much, much broader than that, but we're in a world moving into the future where competitors become strategic partners. And I think that's going to reshape uh, the MBA for the future, which by the way, uh, I remain quite bullish on. I, I, I think uh, our business schools, as colleagues have spoken, um, uh, continue to evolve, to adapt, to uh, embrace agility. And so let me mention a few things that I see happening, Natalia, not with uh, a replacement of the MBA, but, uh, but a recalibration of the MBA. I'd like to start with Dean Park's comments. And Dean Park, please give my regards to John Endicott, my very, very old friend from Atlanta. And uh, please send my best wishes. But let me talk about speed to degree completion. Com continues to be a very keen issue uh, with many uh, MBA students today who, who, who want to move uh, uh, 
uh, through their program and then, and then continue with their lifelong learning uh, um, uh, opportunities that hopefully our, our business schools will provide. So the speed is an issue, Natalia. Uh, Dean Park mentioned, uh, be true to your own distinctive mission and values. This is what continues to differentiate schools worldwide. Uh, celebrate your competencies. Our friend Hervé at, uh, at Kedge, rally around sustainability, for example. I mean, there are, there are issues that are critically opportunistic for all of you. MBA programs today have moved, as all of you know, from uh, general uh, capabilities to hyper-focused competencies. And each of you will select these that work for you, whether it's FinTech or crypto or data analytics or coding or supply chain, sustainability or cybersecurity. And this will continue to evolve, Natalia, over time. My colleagues have talked about a great phenomenon in MBA programs, internships, applications, experiential learning, a very key part of that. I agree with the tech literacy, it's a moving target, but schools will continue to adapt. Uh, I'm a big believer in embracing international standards and this ties to these global partnerships and enhancing student mobility, whether it's for a year or a week, we need to facilitate that because I think there is still something about understanding geographies and cultures and visiting that. Very, very important. And to, uh, and to Constantine, I love your terminology, incomprehensible. It certainly embraces uh, this, uh, this volatility that we're all uh, in, encountering. So let me stop there, Natalia. And again, such an honor to be with so many distinguished colleagues today at this great celebration. Thank you so much, Tim. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, you are you were talking about the alliances, the years. So I think that um, somehow now our alliances are still difficult to realize because um, everyone is trying. We have the Russian, we have the Russian uh, words like uh, pull the blanket over themselves. You know this one, yeah. Uh, I think that we need to learn how to trust our partners more and more. And mm -hmm. if we do it, if we do it, uh, I think that the alliances will develop more successfully. If we're talking about this one, this is my position. Okay, thank you so much. Anyway, <clears throat> Timothy, uh, Gulnara, you <laughs> you are on my list. Last but not least because Danica will not speak, will not speak with some technical problems. So they, they, they asked me not to, not to switch on the Danica. So Ulnara, what would you uh, say about this future of MBA and the problems of MBA which we are facing? Thank you very much for uh, Natalia. Uh, good day, dear colleagues. Again, I want to thank you. Uh, thanks uh, to everyone once again for joining us today in this round table. Uh, we really heard a lot of great ideas, thoughts about the future of MBA. That the and uh, I can add uh, a little bit the my ideas. Education in the 21st century becomes more complicated given that the society and the economy itself become more complex uh, and the uh, development becomes uh, turbulent, unexpected, and comprehensive. Uh, how to, uh, uh, the Constantine told, told us, uh, preparing professional for such a dynamic world is a very difficult challenge. And preparing management leaders for today and for tomorrow is beyond difficult. We observe that, uh, what's the interesting fact we observe in Kazakhstan, in the pandemic period, the um, demand for MBA is growing. Uh, but uh, as I know that it's not just in Kazakhstan, uh, it's kind of the trend in the world. The, our colleagues and experts from the business school across the globe also the mentioning uh, trend uh, of the growing demand for MBA. 
I think it's um, in one hand, managers think of necessity to gain new skills, to be able to manage uh, in the pandemic period, uh, to have the new skills and digital skills, managerial skills. Uh, uh, the, therefore, they seek further education. The MBA may be the, the best uh, solution in that uh, case. On the other hand, business schools become more flexible, more adaptive, and able to offer new formats of the program delivery. I agree with my colleagues that about the hybrid format becomes more profitable. Uh, for instance, we saw a serious increase in demand for the blended MBA program at our uh, business school. We have been offering blended MBA since 2013, uh, and only now we demand, the demand has shown solid increase. The blended MBA combines the interactive online classes and the classic lectures and seminars uh, and on campus. Time is a very valuable uh, resource for the business people. Therefore, there is a growing demand for the programs that they offer formats of utmost flexibility so that the students are able to juggle work and studies and effectively distribute their valuable time. Uh, also, I suppose uh, the Harvard told about the competition be between EdTech and the business school. I agree really that the school uh, cannot compete uh, the, uh, with the, uh, at, uh, the, uh, the biggest tech company. Uh, um, I think that the way for the business school to collaborate uh, in, uh, in that way. Uh, the, the, uh, suppose the business school will move to the liquid learning. Um, this is when students uh, define a preferred format of studies on their own. Liquid learning is a dynamic learning experience, whereas the using technology and uh, IE uh, merges the physical and virtual worlds to provide the outstanding education wherever you are. Um, it can uh, be you can be the um, join the class from Los Angeles, London, Shanghai, or Almaty. Uh, doesn't matter where you are, but you can uh, doesn't matter that you are online or the offline. Uh, you can join to the live stream or the online discussion. The the liquid uh, learning model allows students uh, who are usually top managers and company leaders to complete studies online and enjoy the offline networks uh, with the fellow students. Um, another trend, I think uh, that uh, we see the benefit of the joint MBA programs, uh, joint executive MBA programs, and uh, uh, that that is the why we, uh, the how the business school explore um, the business school is expanding the collaboration between each other. The most interesting collaboration occur when they're bringing together business school from different culture, from intercontinental uh, partnership. Uh, that is because, because the students <laughs> prepare themselves to work in the multicultural environment. And uh, I think it's, the, it's not just trend of the last uh, the pandemic period, uh, period we see this the collaboration maybe last ten years uh, is growing. The hope it will continue the uh, next decade. I also want to put the the creating uh, oh, the trend of the creating MBA programs is, uh, that are interdisciplinary. For example, business administration plus data analytics uh, plus or plus law or art or and so on. Uh, at Almayu, uh, we have the. Mm, for example, the MBA in healthcare management, MBA in financial engineering. Uh, this is the also the the way to 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 develop the MBA program. Uh, business school also integrate hot topics to their 
curriculum, for example, introducing the sustainable development ecology issues to the uh, program. Uh, today, the, the, it was mentioned uh, several times about the, uh, how it's important nowadays. Um, for example, in this year, we have a new course. We launch it called, we call it this course, Corporate Sustainability and Business Ethics. At, um, it, it was the huge di discussion between faculty, uh, the, the, uh, how to put this uh, course as a uh, co-course on our MBA program. Uh, I believe that the MBA program content must be updated and upgraded every two uh, years so that the business schools should give up the date, knowledge and skills uh, that very um, often uh, because the, the world is changing often. Um, I think that's, uh, Natalia, it's... Um, Mm, that's all from me, but we can discuss the, the open the discussion, uh, continue uh, with answer and Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gulnara. Thank you. <clears throat> um, what came to my mind, how would listening to you about the uh, transform, transformation of the MBA programs, according to the new uh, circumstances. How do international standards uh, compare with national uh, particularities or peculiarities? And uh, how international accreditation help uh, the business schools to grow on their own markets, national markets? Uh, who can answer? We hear from the six different countries, the speakers of my panel, from the six different countries. Uh, what can you say about that? And I don't, I don't like to give team the first floor, no team. Let uh, the, the other people talk because you are from the accreditation body. I want you to talk uh, at the end of this question, yeah? Joshua, what would you think about it? <clears throat> what would you say? <clears throat> Sorry, uh, could you repeat your question? Um, I didn't catch you. Uh, yes, how do the international standards compare with the national um, particularities? And uh, is it really help the accredit international accreditation help the business school to grow on their national markets? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and that's a very timely question for us because we've actually uh, been doing both things at the, uh, at the same time, meaning we've just handed in our sort of our midterm report, i.e. application for reaccreditation uh, just a, a couple months back. And at the same time, we've done a three-year accreditation with the Korean government. And pretty much uh, happily, a, a lot of the things do align with each other. So one of the things that uh, we did end up finding out was uh, many of the, the AOL factors that we've been preparing um, and keeping record of for AACSB purposes made, it, uh, made, made us very well prepared for the, the three-year accreditation for the Ministry of Education to the extent that, you know, uh, just, just for a little <laughs> bit of background, uh, Korea is becoming much more strict in terms of accrediting schools because of our population decline. And what they're looking to do is uh, cut down on the number of universities that are open, cutting off support, and only keeping programs that are pretty much viable and doing a good job of providing good education for their students. So one of the things that they do look at is, are we really keeping track of our learning goals and making sure that our curriculum is fitting in line with our learning goals? And obviously that fits perfectly in line with the AOL standards, right? Um, and then secondly, one of the things that they're looking at is, uh, making sure that we're not just offering a um, uh, academic curriculum, but that our co-curricular and extracurricular activities are fitting in line with our curriculum. And again, uh, thankfully, with uh, you know preparing for our accreditation with AACSB, we've been measuring impact and we've been measuring sort of the, the outreach within our communities, not just delivering coursework. So uh, really uh, using an, uh, an international um, uh, accreditation standard has been, at least for the context of South Korea, been helping us a lot in terms of uh, meeting our domestic criteria as well. And you know, very happily, just uh, last month, we were able to be a part of the you know, smaller number of universities that was approved for the next three years 
of uh, what's called the um, Innovation for University Education, receiving uh, a great deal of government grants to continue our innovation uh, in the education that we offer. So I guess, you know, uh, I do know that uh, three of the, the universities that are represented in this panel are AACS be, be accredited and many others are members seeking accreditation or, or looking into the possibility. Um, coming from our experience, um, definitely looking at uh, the, the international accreditation uh, like AACSB has been very, very helpful for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Konstantin, please. Hey, I just wanted to contribute to the question uh, that's uh, out of my own personal experience, um, being a, a member of uh, ICWIS, Amber, not yet ACSB uh, panels, uh, I really, in one of the most things that I enjoy when I look at how the schools adapt to their the national circumstances to international standards, it's 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 a, such a pleasure to see how the, how real schools find the ways to to adapt, and they uh, and they really find uh, beautiful ways. Uh, we do it the same, Natalia. You know, adapting to to international norms, uh, our Russian uh, environment. Uh, it's a tricky question, but you always find really good uh, solutions. And when you travel around the world and you look at and look at different different uh, different solutions, you really find insights for the uh, for your own school. So thanks to ACS, Equus, and Tampa that they give us this opportunity. <laughs> Natalia, back to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Erwe, what about you? Um, I was thinking of the different things when uh, listening of the, the, the few comments that have been made already. Um, first, I, I would say that uh, Cage is very pleased to be part of the triple crown accredited school in the world. So clearly, that's uh, for me, that's a very important credential, uh, especially at the MBA level, because uh, uh, I would say that I'm safe with it. I mean, I have those accreditation for five years um, because I do believe that uh, we are doing somewhat a good job at the school. So therefore, it's a, it's a, it's a safe credential for me to, uh, to, to, to rely my MBA on. So that's one aspect. The second one, and uh, it's, it's more kind of an open comment that I'm making here, is um, I do believe that uh, MBAs will be going towards two directions. And I'm not sure that those, direct, those direction will cross each other at some stage or not yet. One is clearly the digitalization kind of a perspective with artificial intelligence, virtual reality, big data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if we are, I would say, honest with ourselves, I believe that that direction is not sustainable from, I would say, uh, another mental perspective maybe almost social perspective. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I mean, at this stage, I don't see those two directions. So the second direction is a sustainability kind of a direction. And clearly we, what, we, what we read today from all the different reports, there will be a, um, the new uh, big meeting, worldwide meeting in a few days uh, in Scotland. Um, clearly we are far behind what we should do in order to be compliant with what has to be done to reduce uh, uh, higher temperature by the end of the century. So meaning that we don't, I mean, we start feeling it, I mean, with big floods, with uh, uh, big fires, et cetera, et cetera. And I suspect that in the near future, that will be increasing and increasing. So what the point that I want to make here is, I believe that this is also the role of um, accreditation institution like WACSB, Equis, and uh, Association of MBAs, maybe almost to show the duration that those institutions believe that MBAs or business school or universities should go as well. So I understand that um, it's also a market for those institutions. And <laughs> obviously, from one day to the other, you don't want to lose all your clients. Uh, I understand it. Um, but I do believe that having a greater sustainability, uh, I would say, uh, part or criterion to assess what business schools are doing on that specific aspect would be also very interesting for universities and business schools to understand, okay, it's not only the market now that is requiring more sustainable kind of a content, 
that's also part of the accreditation and that should be part of a normal way of managing a university and business school. So I think that it has to go both ways uh, to very much make a change. And so I'm back to what I was saying before. What I see here from a business school perspective is we are always behind and we try to manage change instead of initiating change. So for example, and it's not, I mean, what I'm seeing here, it's, it's not a critic with what we do, but I mean, that's the way it is. I mean, to deliver a new curriculum, it takes a year or two because we, now, we have to go through all the different layers of the universities, et cetera, et cetera. And so the learning goal that we want to establish today that would be relevant today will be in place in one year or two years. So it's not that, I mean, big, that kind of time difference, but it means that our agility is somewhat reduced as well as part of the time that we need in universities and business school to establish and to implement what the market is requiring today. So there is that kind of a disconnection as well, which I suspect that we all suffer, but that's the way that we work. So that's the way it is. But I mean, again, my key point, and maybe Tim, if you can say uh, your view on this is, how do you feel that those accreditation institution will tackle that sustainability aspect as part of the future of uh, what business school and universities are doing from MBA perspective as well, and all the programs, of course. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much, Arwe. Uh, uh, Tim, uh, if uh, we are talking about changes in uh, MBA programs, how the accreditation corresponds uh, to this, and how quickly accredi accrediting body, bodies respond to, the, to those changes? Thanks, Natalia. And again, such great insights uh, um, from, our, from our colleagues. Let, let, me, let, me, let me answer Hervé first directly. Um, uh, AECSP has a deep commitment to societal engagement and impact. Uh, we really are rallying around the sustainability issue. It's embedded uh, in our standards now, particularly in our standard nine. And uh, so very, very important. And we, we continue to learn more about it, uh, but encourage our schools to really push themselves as well. To your point, Natalia, and to what our colleagues have mentioned, uh, we are very enthusiastic uh, with the introduction of our schools worldwide, and we're in 105 countries and territories now, to meet national uh, accreditors, ministries of education, higher education councils, and to map our standards with national standards. And where we can around the world to create uh, joint visits that encompass both AECSB and the ministry or the higher education council in country. So I can speak particularly for our region, Europe, Middle East and Africa. We are doing that now in, in Switzerland, in Norway, uh, in Sweden, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in the UAE, in Turkey. Uh, and this is very important to reduce the accreditation fatigue that our schools are experiencing. And I think there's more opportunity for this. Uh, what Joshua mentioned, um, we're seeing it happen all over the world where, where ministries are tightening up on, on approving uh, local educational institutions. And, and so there's this continuous emphasis on high quality and continuous improvement as well. And finally, Natalia, you know, I'd like to reinforce that we rally around three concepts with our schools and with evolving business education, and that's innovation, engagement, and that's engagement with the business community and with governments and the like, and then impact. And so all three of those are critical foundational components of sort of the continuing evolution of our schools. Thank you. Thank you, dear team. And uh, I have one question. Maybe we are going to the, uh, the conclusion of our session. And the, 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 the staff here told me that the video of Daniel Tapurk is ready to be shown, but I will <laughs> do it at the end of our discussion. I have one more question to everybody. Uh, what do our students want? 
what they still lack in our programs. What do you, what, can you say a few words uh, based on their evaluation forms, please? Who can start? I can start if you want, Natalia. Um, please, Erwe, that uh, um, could be very good, good from you. With all, I mean, all the MBA candidates that I interviewed to integrate the, uh, the executive MBA program in France, um, a bit less in China, because I have a colleague doing the interviews there, um, as well as on the blended MBAs that we do deliver now. Um, I can always see that there is a bit of a lack of confidence with themselves every time. So there is a kind of a sand, small sense tone in their shoes that um, prevent them to make a step towards um, a new adventure, a new direction, a new job, or et cetera, et cetera. So they would. But I mean, that kind of a lack of a bit of self-confidence is something that they all have at the beginning of a program, clearly. Um, for some, it's somewhat big. For some others, it's very small. But it's always, it's always prevent them doing something or something that they have in mind with regard to their career. At the end of the MBA program, I'm not saying that they are all 100% self-confident in themselves, but a big part of them have understood what was wrong with that kind of a sense tone in their shoes, and they have been able to remove it partially or completely. And clearly, that kind of a self-confidence, trust in themselves is something that participants, I do believe, even at the executive level, are looking for. Obviously, if you're part of a, um, of a, of a COMEX, if you're part of board of directors, you will never, never, never acknowledge that you don't, you're not fully confident with yourself. You would never do it. But when you have those type of people as part of the MBA program, they just remove the mask of being the CEO, the mask of being the director of, etc. And you see a normal person like you and me. And this is where you understand that, yes, there is something that is missing in what, with who they are from a self-confidence perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Constantin. Uh, well, I wanted to share two observations. Well, first mm -hmm. uh, is, um, well, some, something that is missing in the curriculum in the MBA program happens when you don't match the expectations of your uh, students. So it's all about managing the expectations and uh, choosing the right students for your program, matching the students, and the expectations with the program. If you fail to do that, you usually fail in, in evaluation forms later. Uh, well, but in general, we all see these uh, feedback forms and we try to, to change something a uh, little bit by little bit. Uh, what we face, and we don't have the answer, uh, a good answer to this, is following. We had a very good uh, cohort of students who started uh, their studies in 2020. And uh, it's an MBA program from uh, small and medium business. And now, in 2021, after the, I mean, the, the, the world came half back to normal, uh, um, most of them said that uh, we have an increase in our workloads because, I mean, so many, so many new opportunities, so many new things that they have to, to do, just don't have time to, uh, to, to study. You know, in pandemic, they in, in the lockdown period, they had a lot of time to study. So they invested this free time in uh, their education. And after that, they uh, suddenly didn't have it. And they said, we love the program. We love what you do, but you just don't have time to do the homework. <laughs> you know, uh, and dilemma for us is, uh, you know, whether to reduce the homework and the workloads, meaning that we will change the program and we'll change our identity, or we say, okay, you leave. And I mean, this, this, that's life. We, we, I mean, we are okay with that. So far, we decided that we are not changing our program and not flexible here because we want to keep our identity. 
Constantine, no pain, no gain. That's part of what we say at the <laughs> beginning of the program. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, the, the, yes, Gulnara, please. Yes, the, I can add uh, the uh, from perspective of our students, uh, what we see, uh, they want to get uh, more and more cutting edge, uh, age practice oriented knowledge and skills. They want to uh, implement, they want to get now and today and implement it now and today in company, in career, in transformation. This is the, the, the biggest demand from the, our students, what, what we see. And of course, the, the, we are trying to meet to answer for this demand and up, uh, do the more applied MBA program. This is the. Thank you. Yes, Joshua. Sure. Um, so if I were to add, uh, I think it is important to get feedback from our students to see what it is they want, but sometimes what it is that they want immediately with their, I guess, limited exposure or experience may not necessarily be what is best for them as well. And I think that kind of ties in with what Constantine has, uh, has said, you know, is it really good for them to have a little bit of a lax, uh, laxer uh, academic um, training, but also along the lines of what skills do they want? And I think obviously people who've been working and coming for an MBA want to, you know, obviously go up somewhere in terms of their career prospects. That's why, why they're taking a year off or, you know, doing an evening uh, for, for this extra coursework. Uh, so one of the things that's been very helpful for us, two things actually, um, is really making sure that in addition to our customary capstone course, where we do have our students, you know, connect with a business and, you know, take a, a class where they're really doing business solving problems or a problem solving um, uh, coursework for a business is um, one, what we have uh, is a corporate advisory committee, which meets every semester. So these are the, the higher level CEOs uh, thinking, you know, what are the things that they are looking for from our students if they were to hire our students uh, into a uh, middle management or an upper management position graduating as an MBA. Uh, so specific skills that they're looking at. And we try to incorporate that either into our existing courses or to create new courses. Uh, and that's why uh, for us, making our curriculum more flexible and having a smaller number of cores and expanding the numbers of possible elective or specializations really helped in this regard. The second aspect was actually not just the highest levels of individuals like CEOs, but having more junior level individuals providing us with feedback. And that comes in the way of alumni. So our, our immediate alumni who found uh, employment maybe within the past couple of years, uh, asking them what it is that they found useful from the education that they received from us and what they wish that they could have gotten from us. So those two kind of uh, areas of feedback from the highest levels of management and lower levels of management have been really helpful for us to remain agile and meet our, our students' interests and needs. Thank you so much, dear Joshua. Thank you. Tim, did you hear everything? <laughs> I did, and, and, I'm, and I'm so impressed. And I'll just add just a couple of points. Oh, of course, yeah. And we're, we're we are finishing the, the discussion. I think young people today have a very keen interest in, um, in, in business and business education as a force for good in ESGs. And so the whole topics related to sustainability, to the United Nations SDGs, they're really interested. Worldwide, we're seeing this. In, in how can they, in their education and their career, uh, connect more with societal engagement and impact? Very, very important. We're seeing a surge again, Natalia, in, uh, in entrepreneurship, in, uh, and, and, and interest among, among students, both young students and MBA students. In, in, in entrepreneurial opportunities and ventures. And I think the pandemic accelerated that and reemphasized that. But again, it's an area that comes in and out of favor in many business schools, but is one that is emerging as a key topic. And then finally, this whole focus on skill set, what we're calling competencies today. And, and, and I think uh, Gunara 
touched upon this wonderfully, that, that, that students want the credentialing, the badges, uh, the arrows in their quiver. They, 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 they want these as they, over the course of their, their, their work lives to continue to add to, their, uh, to these competencies as the market shifts as well. And business schools were in a unique position to do that. So thank you, Natalia. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you. I think that we have the, the fantastic panel discussion. And I am very happy that the people who are responsible for MBA programs and for the development of the business education in their regions are here with us. And I'm, I became more confident that MBA will never die because we're <laughs> leading this process. Thank you so much, my colleagues and friends. And uh, at the end of our panel, I would like our staff to, uh, to put Danica finally. <laughs> Please. Hello, my dear friends in Kazakhstan. Best regards and best wishes from Slovenia, from the headquarters of Siemen and of IDC Blade School of Management. We are very proud of you. When we started with Siemen, Quite some time ago, Alma Yu was the uh, founding member and Azil Beko Zekhmetov, your president, was the one who was starting with Siemen together with a group of other people from Central and Eastern Europe and former C CIS countries. So we came very far all together. We were growing together, learning together. And today we were all also very, very proud when in Trieste a month ago, Rector, uh, Rector Gulnara Kurenkeva was winning the prize for the leadership, leadership of the management development institution, the champion, she became the champion. And so that also shows that Azil Beck is taking care for people who are supporting him, replacing him in some of the functions, etc. Really great. And of course, in, I know that you have a very interesting topic of your conference and I would like to be there and to talk about the future of management education, uh, what the impact COVID had on all of us. On one side it was giving us a very hard time, but on the other we were starting quicker to adapt, to adjust and to go online because many things you can go online, but many things you also cannot and we saw now what is possible and what is not possible. That's why in Siemens, where we believe in excellence as well as, 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 well as in uh, relevance, we were really thinking about how to make management education more uh, high-touch education, also through high-tech, so that you keep the emotions, that you are going further with these great feelings, emotional feelings, which makes this world a better place. And uh, so today, with your MBA celebration of your MBA program, we would like to congratulate you, to wish you all the best, and to make the MBA participants really fantastic people for the fantastic world. You deserve it. Kazakhstan is a great country, and we all believe in institutions like yours, Alma Yu, to make it and to contribute something very big, uh, looking to your mission, you know, something that you would like to achieve and to make not only your country, not only your institution, but the whole world a better, better place. Thank you very much and enjoy the wonderful day of celebration. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear Danisa. And uh, thank you, everybody. The time is over. I think that we really had the good discussion. And I hope that we uh, gain a lot from it. Thank you so much, everybody. Be healthy and see you all face to face. Um, hopefully on Gaidar Forum or... In Almaty, in, uh, Almaty, in May so. of the 22, that we'll be happy to host all of you all face to face. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you.